before uh, okay, all right, so let's get started. Uh, um, now we are going to do your homework three, right? And your homework three is to train a uh, neural network. But uh, I found that I we haven't go to neural network. Although some of you go to the uh, AI centers uh, mini classes last week, right? But uh, some I heard some of you say it's too difficult to understand. So let's. Let me try to explain what neural network is going to do. And, uh, however, I want to um, give feedback about uh, your homework too. Okay. And uh, this is uh, Mr. Sun's presentation. He used an existing pedestrian detection algorithm called HUG based. Uh, okay. And he found something very interesting. For the statue, okay, it has this uh, pedestrian. And for this input image, there is a real person here. But the algorithm doesn't detect the person. Instead, it detected a lot of statues. What's the reason? I want to explain it uh, today. Okay. So this is our textbook. And in section 6.3, here, yeah. okay, there is a section totally focused on pedestrian detection. If you are interested in, take a look of this section. It's not long, very short, okay. And uh, this is the page crop from the section, and uh, I highlight two uh, sentence here, okay. So the method hack based pedestrian detection algorithm was proposed by Dala and the Trix in 2005. Okay, this is a CTR paper and it's very easy to find the paper just through a Google search engine or IEEE Explorer. If I, uh, I use IEEE Explorer to download the paper and there is a very interesting number. The paper has been cited uh, for more than 116,000 no, times. So you can see this paper uh, is very useful. It is liked by a lot of following researchers. Okay, so this is uh, page one and page two of the paper. And okay, also there are a lot of online videos talking about this method. So the first one is uh, a course lecture for computer vision in 2012. Lot okay. in the human detection. Uh, I want to say, take a look of the, okay. Lot in the human detection. So the <coughs> idea here is that um, we will also compute the gradient orientation and gradient direct uh, magnitude and you will see this everywhere that you know the, as I've said the basic operations are that given an image. Okay so I will not play the uh, videos here but if you are interested in you can use your own time to take a look of the two videos. What I'm going to talk about, okay see this is the flow chart of uh, the uh, half based algorithm. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, six steps. Okay, I will explain each step for you. First, they are set. They want to train a classifier to tell whether there is a pedestrian in a bounding box. So they create a, a new data set. Uh, some of the examples are this one. The, they name the, the data set as in real pedestrian data set, okay, along with their paper published in 2005. Before this data set, the, there is an existing pedestrian data set. It is NIT pedestrian. Uh, it was published in ISACV, it's a journal paper for community, it means International Journal for Community Vision, two, uh, five years ago. Okay. So what's the difference between the two data sets? The first is for NIT pedestrian 
that most pedestrians are upright. Okay, they have relatively few host variation, but in in real the assets, uh, you can see there are different poses. For example, this one. Okay, the arm is put on his waist, and uh, there are more occlusions. For example, the people's head pack uh, occlude the subject. Okay. So this is a section crafted from the paper. It mentioned what the NIT pedestrian data set only contains around 700 images. But the INRIA pedestrian data set, it contains around 1,800 uh, images. It's a larger data set with more variation. OK, so first of all, they create a larger data set and they run their experience on the new data set. OK, now let's go to what is the definition of hack. Hug means histogram of gradient. And uh, what is gradient? Okay, gradient is mathematical definition given a scalar function with several variables. Then we can calculate the four point. We can calculate uh, its direction along the direction, the change of the scalar function is the most, largest. Okay. So by definition, the gradient is the partial derivative for all of its variables. Okay. And in this illustration, given the function in this equation, then the derivative uh, Directive of the gradient is draw as the arrows on the line. There is another uh, illustration in your reference book, this deep learning. In figure 4.1, it means given a function as the dark blue line, uh, dark blue curve, okay, the equation of the function is this, okay? Then we can calculate its uh, derivative. Then the, okay, uh, I assume you have the experience of calculus. Then the, cal the derivative of this function is the f prime x. It is just a, a x. So we can draw the x as the green line, okay? So it's a, what does it mean? For every point on the curve on its original function, say this. When x is around uh, one, negative 1 1.5, then we can get its derivative. It is negative 1.5 because of the equation. Okay. So the author, I mean good fellow of this book, he draw this picture to illustrate how to use gradient to calculate the gradient descent. Gradient descent is a method to minimize a function respective to its variables. And this is the simplest uh, case. If, we, if our function is just in this form, and we can calculate its gradient, so uh, for any point, okay, here, once we know its gradient, then we will go a step along its gradient, the direction. So we can step by step approach its local minima, no matter where is the starting point. Okay. However, this is the mathematical definition. And uh, given an image, Images are discrete numbers, like this. How do we calculate the derivative of any point? Okay. So in their paper, 
they mentioned in their papers, six, uh, section 6.2, they describe how they calculate uh, the gradients of any pixel. Okay, you can see here. They, they tried uh, several derivatives. Okay, and I draw the figures like this. The first one is one dimensional uncentered derivative. So there are two derivatives. This is for the uh, horizontal axis, and another is for the vertical axis. The other possible, possible uh, choice is one dimensional centered derivative, like this. And uh, this is one dimensional cubic uh, correlated uh, derivative. And uh, the Sobel filter, it, you, um, uh, you saw it uh, in lecture 203, okay? And it's a two by two diagonal filter, okay? And there's another question. Before applying these derivatives, do they need a Gaussian filter? Yes or not? It's because as you know, applying a Gaussian filter can smooth or make the image slightly blurry. So the advantage is you can suppress some noise. Okay, but whether or not they should or not use a Gaussian filter, it depends on their experimental result. So, okay. And uh, there is another question, what color space should they use? Because given an RGB image, they can convert the image into other color space, LSV, YCVCR, etc., or just uh, combine the three channels into a single grayscale channel, okay? So on their paper, they report the results, okay? Let's see. The uh, sigma as zero means they don't use any Gaussian filter. J given those images, just apply those directives. And also they try different uh, uh, sigma values, okay? And uh, this is, they don't use uh, Gaussian filter, but they use the C correspond, it means this one, Gaussian correlated directive, okay? So you see several uh, curves, okay? So let's extend the two axes. This, oh, let me go to, uh, okay, let me go to the pipeline at first. In the pipeline, you can see on the sixth step, there will be a support vector machine. The post of expression is a binary classifier. Binary classifier means it can tell you, or it, it predicts whether it is a positive result or a negative result. It will return a value. If the value is greater than zero, then it means the machine predicts, yes, there is a positive result. If the return value is negative, it means the machine predicts there is no positive result, or it is a negative result. So, in this case, okay, because if the final result is the value, they can set a threshold. Under this threshold, okay, they will uh, assume, okay, let me say, the final label is, okay, this is, force or no addition there. So they can adjust uh, the threshold so that there will be, when they adjust the threshold, you can just see, as soon as it's a force positive per window, then, okay, some instances will be labeled as positive. But in fact, it was not. Okay, so it is a case like this. So there are a lot of uh, uh, statures here. They are false, but because they are not a true pedestrian, but they are labeled uh, as pedestrian. So this is a uh, uh, false, positive. But however, there is a 
real pedestrian, but it was not labeled as a pedestrian. So this is a uh, force next. So it is a passive by the force. So it is a force passive, right? Okay. So here, okay. When they adjust the threshold, they will get the, the curve. Okay. It means, uh, so which curve is the best? See, which curve is close to the original point, it is the best. It means when they are the same, false positive, they will be less false negative. Okay. So compare the six curves they found the best setting is this one, okay? Is the Gaussian, uh, without using Gaussian filter, okay? And uh, they only show this image, and uh, they use text to describe uh, which other settings best. So the best uh, setting for them is they because there are RGB three channels, they calculate the 1D centered uh, derivative for each channel separately and they use the maximum value as the gradient for that pixel. So it, they found that was the best setting for their data set. Okay, once they have the gradient, then they can compute the magnitude and the orientation. So this is the definition of a gradient for a point. And for an image, there are only two axes, X and Y, for horizontal and vertical. So we uh, use GX and GY for the two values. Then we can calculate uh, the magnitude of the gradient. It is uh, a lot to uh, know, and uh, its direction, or we use the theta, or the angular rectangle to express it. Okay, so given any point, say if its angle is 85 degree, and the magnitude uh, in L2 known is 141, then, okay, the point will contribute to two, two pins of pins. Because if we separate uh, the whole angles into nine pins, it's like this. Okay. So the different angles, this is the center of the pins, 10, 30, 50, uh, 70, 90. And the, the uh, degree of 85 is close to the pin center of 70 and 90. So it will contribute uh, the magnitude of 141 to the two adjacent pins. Okay. So for the pin of 90 degree, it will contribute the value. And for another pin, it will contribute this value. So this is a linearly uh, distributed mode. But however, this is not the only choice, right? The simplest way is just, okay, you find the uh, degree or just the angle. Just put everything into that bit. That is also another possible solution. But which is the best uh, setting for them? Again, they need to check the results of the, their experiment. Okay? So this is the definition of a histogram of a gradient, and uh, there are some factors. Should I use signed or unsigned uh, gradient? It means, unsigned means just use angles of from zero degree to 100 degree. There is no sign. Uh, for unsigned signals, they will consider the whole all possible directions from 0 to 360 degrees. And uh, again, how about uh, the number of bins? Should I divide the, the scopes into 9 or 3 or 6 or 12 or 18 bins? Okay, 
this is the hyperparameters of their algorithms. Okay. And uh, okay, to calculate the magnitude, there are also several choices. The original one, that means L L2 known, or square, or square root. Okay. So in their paper, they also report the results. So they try different uh, combinations. From 0 to 180 means they only use unsigned uh, uh, gradient. For 0 to 306 they means they use signed gradient. Okay? And uh, try different uh, number of bits, 9, 6, 3, 4, 18, 12. And, and uh, again, if all other settings are fixed, then they found that the best setting for uh, signed or unsigned uh, gradient, and uh, the bin number is 9, and uh, unsigned the gradient. Okay. But however, let me remind you again, the setting, the best setting only work for their in-real data set. It may not be the best setting for other data sets. Okay. So why? Nine bins and the unsigned gradient is the best. Okay, the authors they provide their explanation. It means for pedestrian because the crossing is very complex. So for side gradient, it is useless or minute because it's too complex to model the the region of crossing. But however, they also mentioned that for other objects, such as cars or motorcycles, side gradient performs better than unsigned gradient. So it's case by case. In this paper, their primary goal is pedestrians. So they, according to their exterior results, they choose unsigned gradient. Now, okay, for a cell, we can create a, a histogram of gradient. The next is they use several cells to combine those histograms of gradient into a longer virtual vector. And the label is black. Okay, for this example, there are nine cells to combine as a block. Okay. So there is another uh, questions about uh, the factors. So what should be their cell size? And the block size, so in this case, it is three by three. But uh, is it best? Okay. And the uh, block shape, should it be square or circular? Okay. And uh, there will be another normalization uh, question. Given a very long feature vector, how, and uh, the feature vector might be Detracted from a very bright region or a very dark region. Okay, so the great magnitude of green will change a lot. They should or not normalize those feature vectors. Okay, okay so they draw the two figures in their paper to tell readers what is their consideration. So this is if they use R half. It looks like it's a square-based uh, block. They can also use a C-hack, it's a circular hack. For different types of uh, um, blocks, there are different uh, parameters. For the R-hack, they need to consider the cell size and the block size. For C-hack, they need to consider more parameters, the number of radio bits. In this case, there are only two radio bits. But if they have three or four or five, etc. Okay. However, after reading their papers, I found they didn't talk too much about the C hack. They only mentioned it is a possible solution, but they didn't report any experimental results about this C hack block. Okay, but for R hack, they show their experiment out. So for this axis, it's the block size. For 
So this axis is the cell size. So you can see if they use very small cell, 4 by 4 pixels, to slightly larger cell, 12 by 12 uh, pixels. And the black size is, okay, no black, just single cell, 1 by 1. Or 2 by 2, 3 by 3, and 4 by 4. Then compare those settings. They found that the best uh, combination is the cell size of 6 by 6 pixels and the black size of 3 by 3 cells. Okay, and uh, we just mentioned that there's another normalization settings. So they also try different uh, normalization settings. L2 norm means, okay, the vector, okay, no matter how large or small the uh, original feature vector is, after normalization, okay, the norm will become one. So there are several different uh, normalization forms. So L2 norm and L1 norm. Okay. The only difference is whether this is square term here. Okay. There are also not so popular uh, normalization song. L2 hit. Okay. It add a cut for the maximum value of 0 0.2 uh, in the first step, and uh, then take a L2 normalization. This norm is used by another paper called SIFT. SIFT is a very famous descriptor for computer vision, in particular for image matching, matching problem. Okay, so, and SIFT was published in 2002. So in 2005, when the paper was published, they all they think, they thought, oh, whether the feature or the known uh, skin is very useful for us, they try it. But however, according to their findings, okay, they found uh, the results are similar. No matter they use L2 known or L2 his or, uh, okay. So for simplicity, they finally, Final, in the final implementation, they just use the simple L2 norm. Okay, there are another factors to consider. How large should two blocks overlap? So there is a block uh, overlapping ratio factor. It can be uh, three fourths, one second, or no overlapping. Okay. And uh, they also need to consider the window size. So there are three possible window size, 64 times 128, the largest one, median and the smaller. Okay? Uh, you can see when they use different uh, window size, there will be different uh, numbers of blocks. So it will affect uh, their feature vector. Okay? And uh, okay, this is their report. So they found uh, the best case is overlapping ratio is three fourths. And uh, the best case for the window size is 64 by 128. And uh, okay, this is the final uh, figure. It, it is a parameter for support vector machine. So let me slightly go through the support vector machine. So when you uh, Google support vector machine, Usually, they will see this chart. Oh, let me explain. Support vector machine is a binary classifier. So, given two classes, the red dot, the red squares, and the blue circles. Okay. The support vector machine aims to find a, a hyper plane to separate uh, the two classes, and uh, they want so. This is the margin, okay? They want the margin as large as possible. So this is the mathematical expression for support mechanism for the hard margin case, okay? And why is it called support vector machine? Because in this case, for there are one, two, three, four, five, only five vectors. They will contribute uh, to the minimization. 
all of other example points are ignored by the supposed vector version when they try to optimize this equation. So, th so if you, we remove all of those instance points, the same, we will get the same result. So, suppose the vector means the instance really matter. Okay. However, uh, this is the case. We can really find a hyperplane to separate uh, those two classes. Okay, in real cases, they are usually this a soft margin support vector machine. It means we cannot find a hyperplane to separate uh, the two classes very, very definitely. So they will introduce, uh, they introduce a last, mean a called hinge last. Okay, it means for some point or some vectors, they cannot clearly separate it. So they will cause some loss, and the loss is expressed in this expression. If they cannot keep itself from the hyperplane with a margin of one, then there will some loss. And they want to minimize the overall loss of those training sets. Okay, so let's go back to here. That is uh, just the uh, simplest concept of support maximum machine. And the support machine can use um, feature transform to create a high dimensional space. And all of those original feature vectors will Maybe it is unacceptable in the original feature space, but acceptable in the hyperspace. Okay. So they are assigned kernel. Okay. So they have three different kernels. It means they use the hyperspace. If they don't use the hyperspace, it will be the linear case. And what they found is, yes, use a uh, hyperspace and with certain kernel values, it is the best result. Okay, so this is the pipeline of the paper, and uh, okay, let's take an overview. So given those totally around 2,620 uh, images, this is the, if you take a do average, you will find what is the gradient of those trend images. It's like this. So what does it mean? It means if you see, uh, window, a bounding uh, uh, image crop the found bounding. And if you see this pattern, the shape of the image is like a per person, then it is likely is a pedestrian. Okay. In particular where from this second uh, image you see the shoulder and head. If you a picture the Gradient on the shoulder and the head part is very, very similar to this example. Then it is a highly possible uh, pedestrian. All right, so let's take a break. <coughs> so to explain this figure, let me go back to the data set uh, um, slide. Okay, here. Here, the images you see here are all positive images. It means there is a person at the center with the image. However, to train the support vector machine, you also need a negative training examples. It means given an image, there is no people in the, okay, so how large is the training set for the negative? Let's see. Mm. Okay, they are only mentioned the positive. Okay, uh, okay, I forgot to crop it. Uh, I remember, okay. All right, okay. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, okay. There are around uh, 200 and 2,500 positive images and uh, 4,000 negative images. 
etc. I, uh, I forgot the numbers, but however, I remember the neg pass, uh, negative training images are large more than the positive because it's easy to get. You take any pictures, and uh, most of the case there is no people in in the center. Okay. So when they have the positive and the negative training set, and then train the support the vector machines, then there are some positive support the vector, and there are some negative support the vector, just like this. They need to have positive uh, examples and negative examples. Okay. So in this case. The brightness means for the positive support vectors, the response is stronger. And for this case, it's for the negative training uh, support vectors, the response is stronger. So it means what? If you see a image and uh, you see the, si sh the shape like this. In particular, for the head and the shoulder regions, so it means the passive support vectors um, contribute a very passive values to the final score of the support vector. And for this case, if you see an image and there are a lot of regions, okay, they contribute to the negative values to the final score. So it is less likely to be a pedestrian image. So this is the example of the test image. And uh, we use the hug uh, feature to crop, uh, to calculate the AV block. So this is the um, illustration for AV block. And we concatenate all of those features Get a very long, around four, okay, four thousand dimensional space, and the trend is in the support vector machine, and this is the response. So this means if you, if from your uh, test feature, and you see patterns like this, then it is likely to be a pedestrian. If you see patterns like this, then it is less likely. Uh, pedestrian. Okay. So, okay. Now, oh, here ah, the number is here. Sorry. So there are totally uh, twelve thousand negative training examples. Okay. And uh, after consider all of those factors we discussed before, then then tr get uh, average to tell whether there is a pedestrian in the image. Okay, let's see the OpenCV implementation. So for some of you to use the algorithm, the code is very simple. Just include the uh, import the OpenCV and uh, create uh, the instance of hug and uh, load uh, the default uh, uh, detector. It means load a uh, support vector machine. Okay, then given an image, resize it uh, to the, the size you want and uh, call the detect uh, multi-scale function. It means, because let's take a look uh, here again. An image may be very large, uh, okay, and the image may be very small. So they will slightly reduce the image to different uh, sizes and uh, be try the same Window size, okay, because the window size is fixed. Okay, so when you call the detect uh, multi scale, so you can see the scale fac scaling factor. It means it will slightly reduce, 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 and uh, try the same window size. Okay, and uh, once you get some uh, bounding boxes, and uh, just draw it, and. Uh, when you open the OpenCV document, okay, there are some parameters you can see. This is the document for the hug structure. So you can see the block size and the cell size 
and the black stripe. That is the parameters we just uh, discussed uh, in previous class. Okay. But however, you see the black size is 16 by 16. But however, according to this paper, the best uh, black size is 18 by 18. 6 times 3 is 18. So why are they different? Okay. Uh, I think the reason is, remember, the paper was published in 2005, and the data set uh, they used uh, was the in real pedestrian data set, and the passive uh, training example is around less than 2000. Okay, a few years later, in 2009, uh, there is another pedestrian data set called Caltech pedestrian data set. So they are more than 350,000 uh, positive pedestrian instance. So it's larger. With a larger data set, when they train the algorithm again, they may find another set of best parameters. So I think this may be the reason. So let's go back to the question asked by Dr. Sun uh, last week. Why? It is clearly a stature, but uh, the algorithm told me this is a potential. Okay, I think the reason is it because the hard based position only detects the shape. So is the shape that looks like a pedestrian? I think it's true. It's very, very similar pedestrian. And in particular, the shape of this region, the shoulder and the shape of the head. Okay. Okay, for this case, why the child was not detected, but other features were detected? Like again, shape. So the shape of those statues are very clear. The background is white, uh, upright, and uh, the uh, statues are dark. So the shape is very clear. So the algorithm predicts that yes, there is a potential. But however, why the child w was not detected? Uh, I guess reason one, the region, the head of the region, the background is dark. So that the shape of his, his head is not clear. Okay. Another region, the past origin, is the backpack. Okay. The backpack also changed the shape of the pedestrian. But however, uh, this is just my um, guess. Okay, it may not be the case. If you really want to know the reason, you need to track the code. Okay. All right, so uh, here I want to show you a figure. This is the figure in your textbook, uh, figure 5.2. What I want to show is now you see the pipeline of the hard based pedestrian detection. Okay, in Richard Selesky's viewpoint, it is this case. This is a classic uh, machine learning pipeline, okay, given input image. And uh, you can create a feature by your own. So in that case, that is the hack feature, okay. And then use a machine to learn par some parameters so that you can get a classifier. And uh, the machine learning method that we use here is support vector machine. And then finally, you can get uh, your output result. And uh, now we are going to learn neural networks. Neural networks use another scheme, this one. This is a deep learning pipeline. It means the feature will be no longer hand cracked. It will learn by the algorithm itself. And uh, the classifier is also learned by the algorithm itself. Okay. Now, this, uh, again, I will use Justin Johnson's slides. Okay. So let me introduce a uh, data set. 
This is the uh, uh, CIFAR-10. Okay, it was published in 2009. See who is the author of the paper, Hinton. Hinton, okay, the Turing Award winner. In 2005, what his team did is to develop a data set suitable for neural networks. Okay, and uh, in that year, uh, only a few people know neural works well. And uh, three years later, when they proposed their neural network uh, classifier for the ImageNet challenges, they win the prize. Okay, they be become the winner. Oh, and uh, they improved the accuracy significantly, shake the whole computer vision community. But uh, three years before 2012, they are developing a very, very, uh, I should say, small image they are set. Okay? I say it's small because the resolution is very small, only 32 by 32, okay? very tiny image. Okay? But however, there are a lot of images for each class. There are only 10 classes. Okay, we will see Caltech uh, 256 later. Okay, this means there are 256 classes with the data set. But here, uh, CIFASA only has 10 classes. So for those large data sets, they will see this like a toy. But however, this data set has a very special property. It has a lot of images for each class. So this is the um, website for the CIFAR-10 data set, and there are some example images. The 10 classes are airplane, bird, cat, uh, and uh, ship, etc. only 10 classes. Okay? And uh, this is the number. Every, classes, every class has uh, 6,000 images, so totally 60,000. Okay? So now, we are going to learn a linear classifier, right? So for the CIFAR-10 classes, okay, 32 by 32 dimension, three channel. So for an image, how many uh, elements we have within it is 3,072, okay? And uh, there are 10 classes, right? So a simple linear classifiers, we can create a matrix. The size is 10 by 272, and uh, there is another bias vector, it's a 10, okay? Then given an image, okay, we can reshape the image into a long vector, and uh, multiply the weight matrix and uh, the bias vector, so they can, we can get 10 values. We can use the 10 value to indicate uh, whether the image of the classes should be. Okay. So this is a very simple case. We, we even simplify it, okay? Because the original is 32 by 32 pixels. We just assume, assume it is a two by two pixel, okay? And uh, there are only one channel. It's a very, very, so every image has only four pixels. Okay. So this case, if there is an image, and then we vectorize it, and uh, we have a weight matrix. So given the image, we will have uh, several values per, a value per class. So here we even assume there are only three classes, so just simplify. So it, it will help the um, students to understand. Okay, then uh, mathematically there is another expression. It means so this this is the image, right? The values of the image. We can simply add an extra. Value, it is one, only six is one. And then 
combine so that we can combine the vector B to the weight matrix. So mathematically they are equivalent. They are nothing different. So you can see the score values are totally the same. So here we can express our classifier equation as this one. Okay. In the beginning we have a B bias term. But here we ignore the bias term, but in fact they are totally still the same. Okay. Yeah. And the simple linear classifier this is linear. Why? Because if we have a coefficient here and we the coefficient of the was applied uh, to the input image, say uh, 0 0.5, so that uh, the input image becomes darker, right? And the re what will be the result? The result, the scores will also be half of the original ones. Okay, so this is a linear classifier. And then, okay, so this are the example images. So for every class, we have 5,000 training images. And if we calculate the average of those example images, so these are the results. For each class, 500 meters, but we just calculate the average of them. Okay, so this is the plant, car, bird, cat, deer, dog, frog. Okay, so take a attention to this. This is a horse. So when you see the uh, source images, usually the source, the source head is either forward left or forward right. And so when you calculate the average, you can see a shape like two horses overlapped. Okay. One is the head is on the left and uh, another horse head is toward the opposite direction. So, okay, now, remember? Okay, there are a lot of uh, training images here. So for every class, we have an uh, average, average of those 5,000 training images. Okay, so then, how large is the dimension? of the space. It is 3072, right? This is a very high dimensional space. In a very high dimensional space, we have uh, 10 class means, okay? And then, what is our weight matrix? Take a look again. Okay. Our weight matrix is 10 times 3072. It, what does it mean? It means there are 10 vectors. Each vector is a vector of 3,072 dimensional vector. So what is the meaning of the weight matrix here? In when we see there in the geometric view, okay, it means we are going to find 10 vectors in the very, very high dimensional space. And uh, we want to let those training images get the highest scores along the 10 directions. Okay, so what should be the 10 directions? Intuitively, they should be the, the vector toward the mean of the classes. Okay. The reason is here. This is the matrix uh, multiplication. So what is matrix multiplication? It's just the inner product of two vectors. Okay. And there are ten vectors, so there will be ten inner products. Okay. okay. So. Intuitively, what should be the weight of the vector? So for the car class, 
the weight of the car should be this direction. If the mean of the car is somewhere in the high dimension space. So again, for the uh, high cat or what's airplane, okay, so it means the weight matrix in create uh, or separate uh, the high dimensional space into many, many, many small subspaces. Okay. All right, so now, suppose we have a very simple linear classifier, and uh, let's introduce last function here. So that we can use the value last to indicate whether the classifiers work, how well it works. Okay. So usually we will define losses if the function generates a low low last value. It is a good classifier. If it generates high last values, it is a bad classifier. And there, if when you read the textbook, you can find a lot of similar names like objective function or cost function, okay? But sometimes, some people prefer use a positive term. So they use reward function, profit function, utility function, finish function. It means the negative last function, okay? Uh, mathematically, again, they are the same. So this is a given a data set. So X is the image and Y is the label. So in for our sci-fi thing, uh, that's an example. So YI will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 9. And the X9 will be a lot of 5,000 images per class. And then, then we define the loss functions given, so LF is the linear classifier. Given the input image and the, the weight metric, here, again, we just ignore the bias vector B, but they are mathematical reasons, so, so, okay. So the last function will be, okay, we through a function, uh, linear case file, we get a value, or the score of the image. And we will compare with its label. If they are the same, okay, so th there will be no last. If they are different, it means our classifier create a, a wrong prediction. So there will be some last, okay. And uh, this is just for a single example. For a data set, the last will be the average of all those training samples. Okay, in your textbook and the uh, reference book, there are also sections talking about uh, the last function. All right, so let's see two examples of uh, last functions. The first one is the cross entropy last. It is very popular for the deep learning. So the definition of the cross entropy loss is given the score generated by the classifier, okay? And uh, we calculate its exponential function. Okay? Use the natural law, uh, law okay? Then each of the, we convert uh, those exponential values into probability by this equation. It's not uh, complex. Just sum of all of those exponential values as the denominator. So this is a de denominator term. And uh, divided by its value, so it is the denominator term. So we will get uh, the probability of a class given an image. So for this one, this is a cat image. Then we, our um, 
predictor, our classifier predictor, okay, the probability of this image is a cat, is 0.13. And it's a car, is 0.87. So, okay, something wrong. So, the cross entropy is defined as last as the probability of, so here, the yi is the true label, it's a cat, okay? But uh, given the image, we calculate the, the okay, plus is 20.4, so this is the case. Okay. So why cross entropy loss is very popular for the deep learning? There are two reasons. First, the loss has a very well-defined uh, gradient, so this is the loss. Once we calculate the each gradient, okay, then the result is itself. So, so this is a very useful property. It can simplify our calcula calculation for the gradient. And the second, uh, there is a numerical stability. It means, so let's see. Here. here you can see, for this case, the value is very small. And if you have a lot of uh, classes, say, uh, 1,000 or 100, okay? The probability for each, because their sum will be one, for each of them, the number will be very small, very close to zero. And, uh, okay, if we use the cross entropy, okay, see, there is a lock term here. So if a uh, value is very close to zero, the what is the lock term? The okay. The lock term is like this. For a value less than between zero and one, the lock term is a passive term. Okay? So it can help uh, our algorithm to far be far away from the uh underfitting problem. Okay, so uh, there are another loss called multi-class support vector machine loss. The definition is, okay, you see support vector machine, right? And uh, this is the hinge loss, okay? So the another type of loss called multi-class support vector machine is just use the hinge loss to kick as the loss of the classifier. So in this example, uh, three points. If the score of the this image is for the class cat is 3.2, 5.1, the negative 1.3, then okay for this case okay it will be the first term is 2.0. It the best score is 5.1. Okay, but uh, the actual score or true score is 3.2 because we know this is the label a class of a cat. Then calculate the difference. Okay, and this the first term is 2.9. And the second term is compared to 3.2 and the next 1.7. If I, it is less than zero. Okay. It means the class predict yes. The image is more likely than, more likely as a cat rather than a flock. Okay, so it's no, nothing wrong, right? It is more likely than a cat. But the, the classifier also predicts the image is more likely a car rather than a cat. Okay, so this is something wrong. A good classifier should pre generate a score, okay, the cat should be the highest one among all of other classes. So since there are something wrong, the hinge loss so will contribute to a 2.9 value here. So it's very like a support vector. For some points, they will contribute nothing, okay, because they are not support vectors. And uh, for support vectors, they are the real points contributed to the loss. 
Right? Take a look of the support vector machine here. Okay. So those points, they are not a support vector. They contribute to nothing. And again, similar for this region, they contribute to nothing. Only support vectors contribute to the loss, the hinge loss. And uh, in this case, This is the support vector, and this is not, so it contributes to nothing. Okay, so the last for this image is 2.9, and let's see another case. For this image, the true label is it is car, and uh, the hope classifier generates three scores, and the car is the highest one, so there are nothing wrong. Okay, so the the last in this multi class support vector last case. Okay, it contributes nothing. And uh, for this case, we know this is the frog image. But the classifier generator uh, lowest or value here. So it is uh, significantly wrong. Okay, so it contributes a lot of last value here. Okay. So let's do a comparison. This is a cross entropy loss, and this is support vector machine loss. Okay, assume we have uh, three images, and uh, the image is generated, and we know, okay, the image is a uh, cat, for example. Mm. The first column is the very scores of cat, and the second column is the score of uh, car, and the second column is the score of a frog. Okay, so in this case, what is the cross entropy loss, and uh, what is the SVN loss? Okay, so because there are three images, right? So for cross entropy loss, we need to calculate each of them. Okay, and uh, for, okay, so, but however, we just get the concept. You don't need to take it to the number. You you can just uh, think. In this case, if you put the number into it, okay, it will not be zero because cross entropy. Okay, is the value of is the log value of a probability. If the probability is not zero. Or if, uh, if the probability is not one, then the loss will not be zero. Okay, so in this case, yes, we know the image is a cat, and uh, the predict the classifier generates uh, the highest uh, scores for the image, and the uh, cat, 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 totally correct. But however, the cross entropy loss is not zero. But the support vector machine loss is zero. Because in this case, if the cat image gets the highest score, then there will be no loss. Okay, so the cross entropy loss will be greater than zero, but the support vector machine loss is zero. So you see, there is advantage of using cross entropy loss. Because if you, your classifier give me a value, there's nothing wrong. How do you optimize it? And uh, cross entropy, because of the, its loss will, for most cases, will always greater than zero, then so that you can use optimizer to squeeze the weight matrix to reduce the loss step by step. Okay, another question. Okay. Uh, what will happen if each loss just a slightly change of the lesser point? Okay. So for if this example, there are three images. If the third image generates another three scores, another set of three scores, so what will happen? Okay. 
So <coughs> again, um, since you see the they are still correct uh, correctly labeled because it the cat uh, or the first uh, score is still the large largest among the three new scores. Okay, but you can imagine the probability of the three scores slightly changed. So the cross entropy loss will also slightly change. And uh, the support uh, vector machine loss will keep the same, okay, because the, it is still the largest one. Okay, for another um, example, if I have a new set of scores, each of them originally is 10, now become 20, then what will happen? Again, 10 is the largest value among the three sets. So the support vector machine loss is still the same, zero. Because it, since it is the largest one, it correctly predicts then the loss is still zero. But the cross entropy loss will st still change. And the change for what? It will decrease. Because what? This is the probability. The original score is 10, isn't so when the value changes 20, it means the probability increased. The probability increased, uh, then the loss decreased. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, now you, we go through the uh, linear classifier, and then we are going to talk another concept of uh, optimization. Okay, so now we are going to minimize our last value given a weight metric. Okay? And uh, there are some issues. So this is an example. Uh, there is a term called overfit. It means given a set of training images, we are going to find a curve or some model to fit those data. And, uh, okay, for example, the green points and uh, red points here are given data, supposedly, okay? And we are going to find a curve to fit those, to match those data. So, okay, you see, I suppose I use a mm, red curve to fit the those data, and uh, okay, this is the probability of another crack. It means the green dots. Okay, so this is our weight metric. I use the linear classifier to generate a uh, score, and uh, this is the cross entropy loss. Okay, so let's see. For this case, okay, the loss is 8.87 to 10 to the e to the negative 2 order. And uh, the accuracy is 100. It means, uh, oh, the totally correct. And uh, if I slightly uh, uh, change the weight here, and I generate uh, this curve, okay, the accuracy is totally the same. But uh, the loss slightly reduced. And if I, if my curve uh, looks like this, okay, the loss is even smaller, but which is better? It's hard to say. Overfitting means your, your model is too close to your training data, so that the gener generability of your model become um, unpredictable. Okay. So to prevent this problem, there is a term called regularization. This is our data loss. Okay. And uh, we have some preference about uh, the weight metrics. 
Okay, however, this is the prior knowledge. It depends on how you know about your model. Usually, okay, for many cases, uh, researchers will use a regularization term about uh, their weight metrics. And uh, there is the hyperparameter to balance the data loss and the regularization loss. And the metric, uh, metrics will be regularized by certain function. It might be first, uh, second, two, second order known or first order known, or anything possible. It's up to the okay, experimental results, just like uh, the pedestrian detection algorithm. If you use the L2 regularization term, so it will be the summation of the, L, the square of all the parameters, and this is the L1 regularization term. And uh, there are some more complex methods, drawback, special regularization, cut out the mixed up, et cetera, okay? So L1 term, L1 and L2 regularization are the simplest uh, uh, form Mm, cases. Okay, so if we use L1 term, uh, L1 known, L2 known, what is, do they mean? Okay, that means we prefer a simple model. So if you use, um, if your weight, the known of your metric is smaller, it means, okay, you don't want the become very, very large values. So let's see some examples. After adding the regulation terms, let's see our figures again. So in this case, the accuracy is still what? Totally correctly predicted. And the loss value becomes two to the e, uh, two to the order of negative three. And uh, this is 2.5 to the order of negative 3. So this is 2.5 to the negative of order 1. So which is the smaller? So there are 1, 2, 3, 3, 3 last values. So this is smaller, right? Because with the regression term, it balances the loss, data loss, and uh, the weight matrix. So after adding the regression, our optimizer will not uh, go too extreme. Okay. It will find the balance between the uh, regression term and the loss term. Okay, uh, let's see if there are two meta matrix. <coughs> One is one zero zero zero, and another is zero point five for all the four elements. So, what are the? And uh, okay, this is the input matrix. So, you can see the generated uh, scores. Both of them are one, but which value, in terms of the L two regression term, is smaller? So, for the Matrix uh, W1 case, the value is 1, right? 1 square is 1, and 0 square is 0, so 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. And then for this case, it is 0 point half. Each square is around uh, 0 0 0.06, etc. Okay, and multiplied uh, by 4, so the uh, low to known is around 0 0.26 or 225, okay? So this is smaller. So the model will prefer evenly distributed value, okay? Okay, now we have the regression term and we have the loss term. What we are going to do is to find a way to minimize the loss in terms of what? We are how to figure out what parameters should, should be, okay? So 
Mm, this is the optimization problem. Okay. Given a function, okay, we are going to find the best set of parameters to optimize it. Okay. And uh, okay, this is the book about uh, how to optim optimize a function numerically. You can. Uh, this is a book borrowed from our school library. And it's very thick. However, no, 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 no. thick, not thick. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, there is a, so this is a second edition, and uh, it was published in 2006. There was a first edition published in 1999, and our library offers the electrical version. It's a PDF about the first uh, edition. Okay, free, and uh, I downloaded it, uh, and I compared the content of the first and second edition. There are 18 chapters, and the one chapter of the first uh, edition was redrawn, and the two more chapters was added uh, to the second edition, but uh, most of them are the same. So if you are interested in, you can take a look, or just download the uh, PDF from our library. So then I, uh, later I will uh, talk about uh, some terms, and uh, because those terms are very domain specific, they are not mentioned in our reference book and uh, textbook, but in this book they are mentioned and explained. So um, just take a look. I just passed the book for you, and uh, so speak. Uh, it's impossible to. <laughs> Uh, understand it, but just take a look. Thank you. Okay, so how to find the optimized parameters? Okay, the first uh, idea is render, uh, search, check any possible combination of those parameters. But however, this is a brute force. Okay. Uh, it is it's not a scientific way to do it. However, uh, the result is not very bad uh, compared with um, random variable assign. Okay, because well, at least uh, this is a search. It means you try, 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 try uh, many po possible weight metrics and find uh, the best one. Okay, so. The, uh, do, do you remember when you was a high school student, uh, there is a method called Newton method. Uh, Newton method, it means find uh, the slope or gradient and then step by step uh, to go to the local minima. All right, so let's take a break. All right, so uh, the, this is, okay. Um, This is very similar to what you uh, see for the gradient. Um, okay, so the half-based uh, partition detection. Given a function, we want to minimize the last value by adjusting the weight, and the weights are the parameters. So, see this. Okay, see this image. Okay. So given a point, and if we know its gradient, we just follow the gradient to from here go 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 go, go to the minima point. Okay. So here we okay. This is a very intuitive uh, approach. Find the gradient and uh, go along the direction of the gradient. Okay. And uh, this is the great definition. Again, we see this picture. So suppose this is your last function. And uh, now your parameter is somewhere here. And uh, if you know the gradient, then you can go step, go step, and uh, go forward step, go, 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 go. And finally, you will go to your local mini, your 
global minima. So that is here. What we are going to find is the parameters allow us to generate the minimum last value. Okay. But how to find the gradient? By the definition of a gradient, it means if you just uh, slightly change your parameter, you will get a new value, right? And uh, okay, so suppose this is your current uh, parameter set, and uh, you you can just add a small value to the first dimension, and you will get the slightly change of your loss fun last function. So this is the case. So this is the small shift, and uh, you have your original value and a new value. Then you can calculate the derivative. Okay. So you can do it uh, axis by axis. Then you will get the gradient. But it's very slow. And uh, in practice, we use vector projection to calculate uh, the gradient. And uh, let's recall your um, when okay when we when I was a high school student, we learned the Newton method. What's that? So this is Newton, and then this is the image of Leibniz. Okay, they are the mm, founders of calculus. Okay, so calculus tells us what if we are going to find the gradient if our functions is differentiable, then just use this differential to uh, find the gradient and the, the local minimum. Okay. So there are some, this is, we call gradient descent. So given a uh, function, so this is the 2D cases. The yellow, the color means its value of the last function. And the red means the small value is the local minimum here. And the blue mean, means the uh, large value, okay? So this is a Python code, okay? It's something like this. Now we have a initial weight matrix W here. And uh, we will go several steps forward. The number is the number of steps. And then we will compute the gradient based on the loss function, the training data, and uh, the weight here. Okay, so this is the directive for the gradient. Then using a learning rate, I mean, it controls how much we will go forward. Okay. And, okay, so there are a few hyperparameters. Okay, for example, the number of steps. So if we use a very, very large uh, number of steps, it means our optimization process may take a, a long time. Okay, and the, if we use a very small learning rate, it means our uh, point will move slightly, 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 slightly. So which is the best case, we, again, because they are hyperparameters, we don't know. We only can run experiments to validate them. So this is an example. Okay. Uh, okay. So from this point, uh, it will go 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 to the smaller. So with each step, the last value decreases slightly. Okay. However, okay. Yeah, we can calculate uh, the gradient for a single point. Can we calculate uh, a several uh, training examples at the same time? Yes, we can. So, say, let's recall the Cypher 10 data set. For a cl so there are totally 50,000 training images. Okay, it, we can calculate uh, the uh, gradient for one Image every time, of course, no problem. 
But if our memory size is quite large, can we use 32 images at the same time? Or for 64, even 128, no problem, okay? And that is the reason why GPU is very useful here, because GPU is a uh, device which can offer the parallel computation. So that uh, given a bunch of uh, trend images, we can use GPUs to calculate all of the gradient at the same time and just uh, combine all of them together. So this is a batch gradient design. Okay, but however, see, see, there are five, uh, 50,000 images. We need to take a bunch of images from the 50,000 images. So which 32 or which 16 images should we take? Okay, uh, this is a random or statistical price. So usually we will call it the store. The bunch uh, gradient descent Another name is called statistic gradient descent. You just randomly pick some of them, okay, and use those bunch of images to train, to optimize our last function. So oh, again, there are some hyperparameters. So the bunch size, okay, and how to sample those data. Okay. So because uh, we cannot guarantee what images in a bunch will be sampled in every step. So we use the exponential numbers to express our loss. Okay, it is un uncertain. We only know our training samples match certain data distribution. And uh, randomly sample some of them and uh, generate our last value. Okay. okay, of course, there are some uh, problems. Okay, it means for this case, if we use static uh, gradient descent, it may happen like this. This is the initial point all the initial weight matrix, then it goes somewhere. And it go back and it goes, the, it vibrates. And it may take time to solve the problem. So how do they do? Okay, there are some existing methods. Okay, another problem is, if we just use the uh, gradient descent and the layer is a local minimum, like this, and uh, our, uh, Parameters go 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 here, okay? and it found oh this is a local minimum. I have no way to go, but how to solve the problem? Okay, and another case is this is the zero point. Our parameter go 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 here, okay? and it found the gradient is zero along all directions. Is the loss may not decrease? If it, okay, so what will happen? So okay. Hmm. So for those, uh, okay, see, uh, there is the example. Okay, so this is the statistic gradient descent. Compare with your, the previous video, you see, it is very smooth, right? Because if we just use gradient descent without the random sampling process, okay, what the gradient is, then it will go that direction. But with stochastic uh, sampling, the it may go anywhere. Okay. So you can see it go any direction, and it may gradually thank you <coughs> go to the local minimum. So for our first uh, problem, how to prevent uh, our optimizer from failing into the local minimum, okay? Um, a very intuitive uh, method called momentum. Momentum means 
If you know your gradients are going along certain direction, okay, then let your optimizer continue to go that direction. So in this case, okay, this is the case of gradient system. It's a, a mathematical expression. Now we consider a new terms means momentum here, and uh, okay. It is the previous direction with uh, uh, decay row. Decay rate is used it was uh, is row here, okay. And uh, when we calculate the new gradients, we add or minus the existing momentum to become our new uh, weight metric. So, okay, usually we will use rho as 0 0.9 or 0. This means keep as much as the original momentum, but not totally the same. If the gradient become very, very small somewhere, then we will also reduce our momentum according to our previous calculating step. So in this case, <coughs> given this, Point and uh, the gradient is here, the, and its momentum or its velocity is here. Then the actual step will go. This it is a combination of the gradient of the point and uh, the momentum of previous steps. Okay, so <coughs> okay. There are several different uh, expressions of the momentum. Compare this, okay? You can see the learning rate is added uh, along with the gradient of the last function. But in this case, the learning rate is added uh, along with the sum of the momentum and uh, the gradient. So when you read uh, uh, deep learning papers, okay, you may find it is this case or this case. They use the same term, learning rate, uh, uh, momentum. But uh, study, pay attention to their mathematical expression. It can be this case or this case. Okay, so with the momentum, the <coughs> It can, if all optimizers fail into a local minima, it can help us to go through the local minima. And uh, if all optimizer stops at a settle point, then the momentum can help the optimizer keep going to its possible local minima. Okay. And uh, this is the original bad condition. With the momentum, it will go like somewhere less. Go here and go here and go to the lower one. So there is a demo video. Okay. Okay. This is the mom with the momentum and the black curve is the SGD without momentum. So if we let's look at it again. Mm -hmm. okay. The one with momentum will go slightly faster. Okay. There are another um, case. It's called Nisterov momentum. Okay, let's see. <coughs> this is uh, the momentum we mentioned before. For initial point, <coughs> we can calculate its gradient. And uh, we can calculate its uh, velocity and sum them up, okay? But 
for the this flow of momentum, it is give suppose we have the velocity already, then we use this velocity to somewhere and the okay. And from the new point, we calculate its gradient and sum then up. Okay, so uh, different uh, researchers find a different uh, uh, gradient descent method. Uh, sometimes it's better for the case or another case. So there are many different uh, technologies and they have their own term names. Okay, so if we write uh, down its mathematical expression, the next row of momentum is like this. It, see, this is not the FXT because this is the new position. The XT is the original one plus its uh, velocity. And uh, when they have the new velocity and it add it, uh, it back. Okay. So this is the uh, um, Python code uh, to implement uh, this kind of momentum. Okay, and uh, there is also a video. Okay, uh, compare the three types: statistic, discrete descent, plus momentum, and uh, the next row. Okay. So this is just an example. Which is the best case? Is the hard state. You need to run experiment to check it. Okay, and then there is a adaptive gradient. So let's see. If our gradient is very small, then what will happen in our previous case? Okay, if if our gradient is very small, it means our velocity will be also very small. And then, then the distance we can move it will also become very small. So adaptive gradient just means let's consider the norm of the gradient. If the norm is very small, or it means the gradient is very small, then divide it so that we can increase the distance we need to, we can move. Okay. So the, in this case, so in this case, if we use adaptive gradient, then this is the slope direction. It will move faster. But when it go to this direction, it means it is the flat region, then great adaptive gradient can help our optimizer to go further distance. Okay, there is another adaptive gradient uh, called RNS prop. Okay, it, the f it stands for root mean square propagation. And uh, it is mentioned uh, in Hinton's course life, it was never published as a paper, but it is widely used uh, in the uh, deep learning community. Okay. So what's the difference between uh, ADA grad and uh, INS prop? So the only difference, it had a um, decay rate here. It's not only consider the norm of the gradient, it will say, okay, uh, compare with the previous one. If currently my norm become very small or become very large, I will not use the new norm. I will take a reference of my previous uh, gradient value. Therefore, it has another name called leaky eta gradient. Okay. And let's take a look. Compare them. So, if you use um, momentum, because momentum, the problem is 
you have actually, uh, the property of the momentum is because it has momentum, so it will go 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 for all often overshoot. So this, when you see the green uh, blue curve, you will go see this go too much, and then it has to go back. And with the IS propagation, then it will not and uh, go here and turn around to its optimize the local optimize. All right. So okay. When we combine momentum and the INS propagation, then we get the eta momentum. Okay. So this is a very, very popular optimization in um, deep learning. Okay. So see, this term is the momentum. Once we have the gradient, we use uh, a beta it means the decay rate to control our momentum. And uh, the second term will be used in the denominator. It is the concept of eta um, gradient. It means when we have a very small gradient, we adjust it, make it uh, larger. Okay. If we have a very large gradient, we slightly reduce the size. All right, so <coughs> there is a question. So what will happen in the very early stages? So for example, T as one, it's just the beginning. If we just use, because in the beginning, we assume our momentum for the uh, velocity term or for the Denominator first of all are zero. Okay, then what will happen if the t is one? It's just the beginning. Okay, so c because momentum in the beginning is zero, so this is zero times the beta number. Okay, plus its gradient, and the, the second momentum is also zero. So then it is maybe very very small. So this is a small value, and this is another small value. What do I mean? It means in the beginning, your optimizer will grow very slowly. So, okay, they um, use a unbiased momentum. It means if your t is a small number, say one, two, three, and uh, you have a uh, uh, decay rate of beta one and two. It's very close to one. Okay. Then you use the exponential operator to okay, see when your t is small, a very a number close to one, but slightly less than one, is exponential to the order of t will be a number still close to one. Okay. So one minus a positive number close to one, you will get a very small number. Then you can boost your momentum for one and two. When your t is a large number, say 100 and 200, then the beta one and two is a number close to one but slightly less than one. Then beta two to the order of t will be a value very close to zero. Okay, then your momentum will almost the same as your original momentum. So the, this design is to help uh, your optimizer go further in the early steps. And you can see uh, many, many papers, they report, they use Adam as their optimizer to solve their uh, but finding the minimum um, weight measured. Right? So compare the four methods. Okay. And then this is a table. Okay, let's see. A statistic gradient and the add and so what's the difference? So if you 
form to use momentum, okay, here, you have, so this is a gram plus momentum, and uh, nitro and add up. And if you want to adjust the uh, step length according to your gradient, then this is the add second momentum, or adaptive learning rate. Then you have add up rate, or RNS plus. Okay, if you want to use a leaky second momentum, then you have the RNS plus. And add -on, the optimizer includes all of those properties. So that's the reason why many researchers, they prefer Eden as their first choice. Okay, so uh, there is uh, another interesting thing. Okay, so we know this, we have the regularization term, right? And if we use the L2 known as the regulation term, it has a name. The name is weight decay. So this is a general case. We add our regulation term to the last term. And because we add uh, to the last term, then when we calculate uh, the derivative in terms of weight, so of course th we know the result is two times lambda times itself. Okay, so this is mathematically very intuitive. But some researchers, they found if they add the derivative or momentum not to the term of G, but to the term of S, then they generate a slightly better result. So, okay, this is a definition of uh, uh, Weight decay. You can find it either in your textbook or reference book. Okay, and uh, this is a paper. See, it was published in ICLR 2019, just uh, four years ago, and uh, it means decouple the weight decay regression. So, this is the add-on with the L2 known. So it means we will add uh, the. Um, Turn here, but they propose another optimizer. Optimizer slightly move this turn from G to its theta. Okay, it means this case, and then they did the experiments. They did the experiments in the uh, CIFAR10, uh, the CIFAR10 data set, and they compare the results of the two optimizers. The red one is the add-on, and the blue one is the add-on with decoupled uh, weight decay. And they call it the add-on W, okay? So in the early steps, there's little differences. But in the, uh, when, in, along with the epoch number increase, you see the differences. Okay. And they also um, compare okay, the classification results. So you know the CIFAR 10 data already, right? Okay, so this is the overall uh, error rate. So they found that their Adam W can achieve better classification rate. So the law is the better. Okay, so this is very interesting. They just uh, slightly tweak uh, the position to add the uh, derivative back and then generate a good result and uh, they publish the paper. Okay. So this is the interesting part of the numerical amortization. You sometimes just uh, study trick here, trick here, just uh, change the parameters or settings. Eh? For some cases, Oh, you generate a better result. Okay, so since we talk about the uh, CIFAR 10, okay, you can go to this website, or paper with code. Uh, I think some of them are familiar with this. And you can see this. For the CIFAR 10 data set, the best result, uh, of the best classifier so far is the VIT, uh, it means 
visual transformer uh, goes by. And it has achieved the, the accuracy about 99.9%. It means it, it, for the one, uh, remember, there are 50,000 training images and 10,000 test images. So for the 10,000 test images, almost only a few. I mean, since 99.9, only 10, 10 images will be wrongly classified. So it's very, very accurate right now. And uh, let's take a look. Uh, OK, this, uh, this method, shake, shake, OK, it is the method they used to run this experiment. You see, this paper was published in 2009, and uh, the Shake Shake, uh, yeah, it is, was published in 2020. Yes, the, the years are almost the same. Okay, so now let's go back to question. Okay, so from this book, uh, if you take a look, you can find the gradient descent. It's only, the author only used one chapter to describe uh, the gradient descent method. And uh, are there other numerical optimization methods that can be used uh, to solve the, um, optimize the minimizing loss function problem? Uh, yes, there are. So gradient descent is the first order optimization method. It means given a point, we use a line or just a one order direct directive to approximate our next step. So in this case, it, from here, it's going to the other. But, uh, okay, there are other methods called second order optimizer. Given a uh, last function, we can use second order, it means we use a quadratic curve or a surface to approximate the last function so that it may help us to use fewer steps because it is more accurate to get, find the direction, go to the local minimum. Okay, so this is the book about the numerical expression. You can uh, found the data here, and uh, there are several chapters. Okay. Usually, in mathematics, it depress the second order aspiration easy by the second order Taylor expression. So this is our last function, and uh, given an initial point uh, w zero here, so this is the first order. Um, uh, Taylor expression. So you see, this is a gradient. This is a gradient, and there is a difference between your original point and uh, your new point. Okay, and this is a second order optimization. Second order means you have two turns. It is this is here and this is there, and uh, you have a uh, Hessian. Okay, so this is the Hessian. Hessian is look is like this. It means there is a second order derivative along the, uh, alo for every um, variables, okay? So along the vertical axis, you can see there are x1 square, x1, 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 x1. Along the ver uh, horizontal square, you can see there is also x1, 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 x2, xn. So, however, can we calculate uh, the Hessian matrix in order to use the second order optimization for image classification problems? Well, there are some difficulties, uh, difficult points, I should say. Okay. Uh, first of all, is if we want to calculate uh, the Hessian, okay, it, it takes the order of n squared. Okay. 
But however, if we want to calculate the, the inverse of the Hessian matrix, the computational load is order of n uh, cubic. So the computational load is quite large. Okay. And uh, assume if we have, say, si for the sci-fi test, I said uh, it has 10, uh, 1, uh, 10, uh, 50, Thousand training images. This is oh, even though the, for the small images there are a lot of uh, samples. Okay, so there are some uh, ways to reduce the computational load. One is the BGFS method. Okay, and the BGFS they are okay. okay. The BGF, why is it called BGF? Because uh, it was invented by four authors, Broden, Fletcher, Goldfarb, and uh, Shannon. So use their first uh, character, combine them together. So it was, okay. The, you can find uh, the description of of the BGFS method in this book. So, okay, the concept is, so this is the algorithm. It means we are going to minimize our uh, loss function, okay? And uh, suppose the gradient is greater than certain threshold, then we don't need to Compute the inverse Hessian matrix for every point. They propose an iterative approach to generate the same result. It means in the beginning, yes, we need the first inverse uh, Hessian matrix, but then we can calculate some values SK, YK, and uh, rho K and uh, use this equation to get the next Hessian function. And what is the SK and the YK here? The definition is here. And what is the rho K here? It is here. So it means we can reduce the computational load from order of n cubic to order of n square. Okay, so this is the uh, reason why BGFS method is very popular in the optimization community. However, for some cases, if we don't have a sufficient uh, memory, what to do? To? There are some met another method, slightly modified the BG BFGS method. It's called the Hello BFGS method. Okay. So, what I want to uh, share with you here is, okay. We are going to deal with computer vision problem, but there are many fundamental algorithms or theses. They are mathematical. So, in practice, okay, if you don't want to touch those mathematical parts, just keep in mind, use patterns as your first choice because you are going to train your your networks for homework three, right? So you are, uh, if you want, need to pick up an uh, optimizer, use Adam. Okay. Otherwise, you can use the static the gradient descent uh, plus momentum as your second choice. Okay. Right. And uh, there is a web demo. Okay, uh, let's take a look. Uh, okay. okay. If you go to the demo, it shows you how to, what is the linear classifier. Okay, so in this demo, there are three classes, red, uh, green, and blue. And uh, this is your initial weight. So you can see, because there are two dimensional points, so three classes. 
So your weight matrix is three by two, and this is a bias vector. Okay, and this is initial value. So start the update. Okay, you will see with an optimizer, it will update uh, those weight values, and then it will do, 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 do. So this is the loss function with the iterative feedback, the loss function continually decrease. Okay. And uh, you, if you want, uh, you can uh, stop here and uh, see it step by step. step. And you can randomize your uh, parameter. So this is, uh, if you want, you can also add some more uh, po points by yourself. Okay. Here you can, so see, this is the L2 regulation term, and the, the number here is the parameter to balance the loss function, uh, function loss, and uh, the L2 normalization term. Okay. So if, let's change it slightly. So if, we, if I prefer a very large uh, regulation term, and uh, let's go again. So you will see a different result, right? And the link uh, is here. You can try this if you are interested. And uh, okay, let's go back to this. Is the slide used uh, for the mini course offered by um, our AI center? And uh, now, okay, let, let's see. <coughs> okay, learning rate. Now you know what is learning rate, right? because you see a lot of equations in our slides. Learning rate and the regression term, re, re, it should be regularization parameter. Okay, this means the parameter balance the regression term and the function loss. And the batch size, it means in stochastic uh, um, gradient descent you will randomly pick some training examples to calculate the, like your batch gradient, right? So this is the parameter. And uh, there are four different uh, optimizers, statistic gradient is then Adam and Adam data item. I have no idea what the Adam data is. I need to choose an Ada gradient. And for each optimizer, there are a few parameters you need to uh, Set. Okay, for Eden, they are beta 1 and beta 2, right? So now, I hope some of you uh, couldn't understand what the slide was previous week. Now, you have the basic concept. Oh, I know what they are talking about. Okay. And uh, now we are going to the... Uh, area of neural networks, okay? What do we have now? We have a linear classifier, right? Okay. And the, the linear classifier can help us to generate uh, some scores so that we can use either uh, cross entropy loss or LVN loss to create a, a loss function. And then we use optimizer to tune those weight metrics so that we can reduce our total loss, okay? And, uh, okay, here, uh, say this is against the sci-fi 10 mean values, and uh, suppose we have many, many, uh, just two places, and uh, these are their coordinates of those two places. How could we use a linear classifier to separate them. Okay. One approach is, okay, we use feature transform. In this case, there are two, every point has two coordinates, right, X and Y. And if we transfer them from the uh, Cartesian coordinates to the polar coordinates, then it will look like this. Then we can have a linear classifier to separate the two classes. Okay. So another 
way all some existing approaches, we find some image features. For this example, we can use the color histogram. Now you know the histogram of gradient, right? That is a, a kind of descriptor, or we say feature vectors to describe an image. We can also use its color information to do it, okay? For example, given the frog image, because there are a lot of green pixels, so if we create a histogram of color for the beam of green, it will be very high. Okay, okay and uh, this is the history of gradient we mentioned in this case before. So, <coughs> what we are going to, uh, there is another feature description called back of words. It means we randomly extract a lot of patches for our training image sets and uh, create uh, some code book or visual work. Then given an image, we encode the image by the trend or prepare the uh, visual work. Okay, so it means we try to find a way to describe our images in turn. L let our image become a vector. Okay. So, and then we can combine those vectors into a very long vector. Okay. That's what the, it's very like what we do for the hub of uh, pedestrian detection classifier. Okay, so this is an example for the winner of the 2011 image net classifier. It used shift feature and uh, color feature and uh, reduce the combined feature. You see 128 concatenated with 96. So the row feature is around more than 200 dimensions. And the t it used principal component analysis to reduce the dimension to 64 dimension. Okay, and uh, remember, uh, the principal component analysis was mentioned by Mr. Mr. Wang the in the early of this lecture. All right, uh, let's stop here and uh, uh, remember, all of those slides are available online because it, it, they are courses given by Justin Johnson. If you have time and interest, in, you can read it by yourself. All right, uh, that's our close today.